Good morning once again, everybody. Uh, we're going to study now, as you know, uh, Sensei's Guidance. Its title, the 21st century, will be, an a- will be an age of great voyages of the spirit. I really feel this particular guidance is uh, probably, uh, if not the most important, certainly one of the most important guidances that he's given uh, in recent times. Because what we have here uh, is his vision of the future and uh, his predictions of the way in which life will unfold uh, in the coming uh, 50 or even 100 years. So uh, it's extremely important that we grasp that and understand it. This is not something I think we can do overnight. It's something that's got to be triggered off in us through his guidance, through studying his guidance. What uh, we should be clear about is that uh, in the same way as when we learn from the Gosha, we know it all already. The purpose of study in Nishinaishonin's Buddhism is nothing else but to revive your eternal memory. Your Buddha state, in other words, knows it all, but your mind hasn't grasped it or isn't open enough to be able to grasp it. So the process of study and uh, the, those three practices, study, gongyo and danoku, and introducing this Buddhism to others, from our own individual points of view, the whole purpose of that is to open our lives and our minds to our Buddhahood. And study plays a great part in that. I never had thought of that until about a year after I started to practice. I sat on a train coming back from Taisekiji when I was living in Japan uh, with a, a, a gentleman, Japanese gentleman who practiced for something like 35 years. And he said to me, please remember, Mr. Corston, you know, when you're reading the Gosha, that you know it all. It's there to revive your memory, your eternal memory. Quite a thought, isn't it? But actually we get proof of this often uh, when you're doing uh, Shakabuku, when you're introducing someone else to this Buddhism, <laughs> you're talking about it. I'm sure some of you have had the experience that afterwards you think, gosh, was that me really talking? All those amazing things I was saying. That's the proof. So, uh, uh, let's really take this guidance uh, as something accepted, as something important. And although we're studying it today, we're only going to be able to study uh, perhaps a quarter of it. It's so long, and there's so much in it. Please don't leave it there. Go on reading it and really trying to grasp what Sensei uh, is meaning in all that he says. Okay, everybody. Good. So uh, we'll take it bit by bit. First bit's quite short, and then I'll ask Ben to read it. The 21st century will be an age of great voyages of the spirit. This guidance was given at the 20th Headquarters Leaders Meeting held at the Nagano Training Center in Karuizawa, Nagano Prefecture, on August the 17th, 1989. The elderly subsist on the past, and the middle-aged subsist on the present. In contrast, young people subsist on the future. This is not a matter of age. Rather, it comes down to the attitude with which we live our lives. It is a question of one's heart. I really feel Sensei gives us a big prod (coughs) immediately doesn't he, with that opening sentence. And of course it begs an answer to a very important question. How are we in our own lives? Are we young? Are we middle-aged? Or are we elderly? And as he said, it's nothing to do with age. But this was meaningful to me because I could think back to uh, when I was very young, but in a sense already 
middle-aged or elderly, which was in World War II, when uh, at the age of 23, I had a responsibility, like so many other young men, which was far greater than one would normally have had in normal circumstances for something like 10,000 men and a great deal of uh, warlike equipment and so on. And in those years, uh, which were in action uh, in Burma, uh, I was old already. I could only think of the present anyway. I was certainly not young. I was middle-aged, even though I was only 23 years old. So, how do you feel, all of you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it would be quite interesting to see how the, uh, the breakdown is of ages here. Would you mind? It's a terribly tender thing, especially for ladies. <laughs> but hands up everyone who's under 30. Under 30. Right. Okay. And hands up everyone who's between 30 and 60. <laughs> and hands up those who are over 60. <laughs> well, as Sensei says, anyway, it's not a matter of age. It comes down to the spirit or the attitude with which we live our lives. And if we're practicing Lichen Daishon in Buddhism, we can all be young at heart. If we practice wholeheartedly and correctly, we shall live our lives based on the future and not uh, on the past. That's the truth of it. So uh, this depends on certain things. To stay young, truly young, in the sense that uh, Sensei is talking about it, we have to understand that life's eternal. That is certainly one must. And this is why I so constantly emphasize this point at every opportunity at the moment. We have to challenge this thing. Because so long as we fail to do so, it means that there is something still in our lives which is causing us not to be able to face the whole matter of death. That is why it's so important. So we must. Whenever we pick up the Gosho, we must almost surely read something about the eternity of life. Therefore, in truth, we can't understand Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism totally unless we can embrace the fact that life is eternal. Not just as a theory, but deep in our lives, we feel it. And if we don't feel it now, the only way is to challenge it in front of the Gohongu. We have to break through that thing of sort of wanting to avoid looking at death. We have to break through that. It's extraordinary how subtle this is. We have to face it, break through it, and chant Daimoku to truly understand with our whole lives that life is eternal. And uh, I can assure you, every such prayer will be answered in a way which is uh, very personal to each one of us, but we shall definitely get the answer. We shall know it right through, deep into our lives. This is true. Life is eternal. So, uh, the fear of death, which avoidance of looking at death amounts to, is fear. <coughs> is, again, a very subtle thing. Because people avoid facing it, it lies there within people's lives and in the most cunning and subtle way creates a disturbance, agitation. The negative power of that fear of death is unbelievably strong. And without realizing it, it affects one's actions in many different ways and unfolds and so on.
So the importance, of course, is that if you believe in eternal life, it will help you to establish your life based on the future. Even people with children who they know are going to live on uh, far, far ahead of themselves, still, if they do not understand that life's eternal, they will very rarely be able to sustain actions towards the future. The parent looks upon themselves as getting old and losing touch with youth and so on. So chanting Daimoku and working for Kosen Rufu we have nothing to fear because in the end it will force one to face this point and open our lives to it. So in this way, certainly that is one main and most important reason that through this practice one can keep the young in spirit and believe in the future. Don't you think? So then, uh, another reason uh, is stated by Sensei in this next paragraph that Ben will read. The Buddhism of Nichiren Daishonin is the Buddhism of Honin Myo, or the true cause. It is the great law for the sake of the present and future, the law that enables us to establish a state of indestructible happiness in our present existence that will endure eternally. As a devotee of this Buddhism, I have always sought to advance on the forefront of the age while maintaining a forward-looking perspective. I am already trying to visualize in my heart how things will develop in the next 100 or 200 years. I have no doubt that that great aspiration and hope of the future also shine forth in your hearts as well. In this sense, the 21st century has in fact already begun for us. Key line. The 21st century has already begun for us. Why? Because we are making causes already, the effects of which will appear in the 21st century. So, as you know, uh, in the Gosho and also uh, uh, Shakyamuni taught the same principle of the law of cause and effect. Our present is created by the causes we've made in the past, which bring uh, the effects which shape our lives at this point in time. Everything that happens to us now has been uh, created by a series of causes made in the past. Some could be yesterday, some could be when we were children, some could be in a previous life. So, uh, on that uh, basis, of course, what we are doing today and tomorrow and the next day is what will shape the future. So, uh, since it says the 21st century has begun, whether we like it or not, we're making the causes now to shape it. Well, this is a very important matter. How many people in the world really understand this? How many politicians understand it? Or statesmen? Still very, very few. So this is why uh, Sensei emphasizes, too, of course, the importance uh, of youth. Because they're the ones who are actually going to live in all this far longer than I will. So the importance of facing the future and deciding what sort of a future we want, and indeed working towards achieving it, is very important right now, at this very point in time, isn't it? So, uh, this is uh, embraced in Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism in the spirit of Honin Myo. You say every day in the third prayer, don't you? You thank and praise the Buddha of Honin Myo. 
Honinyo, Honinyo means the principle of the true cause. There is also a principle of the true effect, which is called Honganyo. Many people live their lives based on the principle of Honganyo, the true effect. What is meant by that is those people who base their lives on what they've experienced so far. In other words, the effects of the causes they've made in the past. Or indeed by listening to the advice of other people who are basing their lives in that way. Thousands, tens of thousands of people are basing their lives that way. Oh, I'll never achieve this because, because, because this and that happened to me in the past. I know in my heart this is beyond me, etc., etc., etc. I can't do this. Waste of time, my try. And so on. But this is a terrible thing, of course. Totally negative. We're changing every moment of the day. Yet, the spirit of Hongamyo is saying, nothing can change. What happened to you in the past dictates what's happened to you now, really. That's what that spirit is saying. Totally negative. But we practice the Buddhism of the true cause. The Buddha of Honimyo taught him. That's the spirit of saying to oneself, okay, that may have happened in the past. I'm not going to ignore it, but what I'm concerned about is the future. Okay, maybe I failed my exams at school. That doesn't mean to say I can't pass my exams now to achieve this or that or the other. Through the power of the spirit of Honimia. Fresh advance, isn't it? Fresh causes that create a fresh future. And of course, this is combined with our practice to the gods. But this is the spirit of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism. It's the spirit of the Gakkai. And it must be our spirit. Human beings dislike change. This is the thing. It's convenient and comfortable to have a spirit of Angamia, although it doesn't make you happy. You feel sort of safe in a trench or ditch which this spirit leads you. It doesn't involve any challenging of life. Very easy to slip into that apathetic way of life. And there are great sections of the population who live in that way and, of course, live in misery and frustration because in their hearts they don't want to live that way. I wonder how much of the frustration we see is because of that spirit. Amongst young people, too. No football hooligan would remain one if he had the spirit of Honimia. So it's a very crucial point, isn't it? And we repeat it every day in third prayer, so there's no excuse to forget it. I guess that's why it's there, to remind us. Have I got a spirit of Honimia today? Yes, because I'm doing a great God here. And that is going to create great causes which will make a great future. That's the whole spirit of God here. So also in that prayer, interestingly, uh, it refers to the three properties of the Buddha. And it also refers to the three virtues. So it's worthwhile, just for a moment or two, reminding ourselves what those are, making quite sure we all understand. So the three properties or attributes of the Buddha are nyoze so, nyoze sho, nyoze tai, which, as I was saying, I think on summer course, we recite 24 times every day, provided we do two gongyas. 
because we re repeat those, don't we? After every prayer, before every prayer. So it's very simple, really. You know, this. So is the physical attributes of the Buddha, the actions of the Buddha. We are capable, through this practice, of revealing the physical actions and appearance of the Buddha. And secondly, the spiritual aspect of the Buddha. Those qualities of wisdom, compassion, courage, decisiveness, all are within our lives. And we can reveal them through practicing as Nichiren Vajran and talk. And thirdly, uh, the very entity of the Buddha, Nyoze Tai. That means to say that Buddhahood exists in the very heart of one's life and because of that we can reveal the spiritual and physical aspects of the Buddha. <coughs> so we struggle, of course, to see proof of this through the inspiration of Nichiren Daishonin's Gosha and of the way in which we're guided through senses, guidance, and so on, we begin to realize we should be seeking it. I didn't even face the fact that Buddhahood could exist in me. I remember for at least probably a year or two of my practice. Because my opinion of myself, really deep down, was so low that I, I guess my mind was subtly and subconsciously almost saying to me, you know, that's ridiculous. We have an image, too, that a Buddha is something almost superhuman. It takes time to realize that Buddhahood exists and reveals itself in people who otherwise are perfectly ordinary. And then, uh, in the same prayer, we acknowledge the existence of the three virtues of the Buddha. The three virtues of parent, teacher, and sovereign. So, in a specific sense, the only person who we know who has revealed those three virtues in full is the Buddha, or the Buddhas. But, uh, in a general sense, we should be working to reveal those virtues within our own lives. To be a parent to everyone. To be a teacher to everyone who we encounter and who are willing to listen. And to protect everyone, and that's to say the sovereign, to protect everyone through the power of our practice. So I can't overemphasize that our activities as bodhisattvas are not restricted, are they, just to our members, just to perhaps our night on, but to everyone. Everyone should be embraced in our daimoku. Everyone in our environment, everyone in our village, everyone in our neighborhood, everyone in our country and everyone in the world. So this is uh, the task that we have. We are responsible for them. There is no one else who has found the ultimate truth. There is no one else except people who are chanting nam myoho renge -kyo. Don't get misled into that uh, wishy-washy way of thinking that there may be other ways to find the ultimate truth. Now your only kill is the ultimate truth. Not a way to it. It is it. You're there. <laughs> Though it takes you years of struggle to open one's mind sufficiently to realize it. 
So therefore, we are responsible. We should express and work to struggle to reveal those three virtues in our families and in our districts and groups, of course, in our places of work, everywhere, with members and non-members alike. So I believe in recent years there's been an astonishing change in Japan, though it's still not an obvious thing, <clears throat> still not anything that would hit the headlines. There are so many neighborhoods in Japan where uh, 15, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago in some, people were suspicious of the Sofa Gakkai. But things have changed. Leaders in those local districts and things are often approached now by non-members if they really hit some great problem in their lives they'll go to them for advice they may not tell their friends still that they went to the Sohagata leader for advice but they'll do it in many many instances so just uh, quite near to the Sohagata headquarters in Tokyo which in a much of place is called uh, is one of the greatest hospitals in Tokyo. It's called the Keio, Keio Hospital. And uh, nowadays, and for some two or three years now, where the Keio, the doctors in the Keio Hospital are up against someone with a terminal illness, carrying a disease for which the cure is still not medically understood, they'll say to them now, you know, we're sorry, we can't do anything for you, but it if you like to go across the road <laughs> and see the Sofa Gakkai, maybe they can give you good advice. So an increasing number of doctors in Japan understand uh, the power of Namurayika and are beginning to acknowledge its existence <laughs> because they've had such incredible evidence in their hospitals and amongst patients of the difference between uh, a person who is chanting as a patient, a doctor who is chanting, and a nurse who is chanting. So they carried out a series of tests actually in KO Hospital on this very point. So it's very interesting. Gradually, those three virtues of the Buddha, in other words, are appearing in people's lives. So of course, it's through the gradual appearance of the three properties of the Buddha and the gradual appearance of those three virtues that individually, in an individual sense, when making the causes of the, to shape the future, the great causes. Good, so let's read on. These are certainly times of bewildering change, whether in the realm of thought, technology, or social trends. What was new just a few years ago has already become old and lost its appeal. This tendency will become all the more pronounced as we approach the 21st century. Outlooks and values are increasingly diversified and it is becoming difficult to comprehend reality in terms of traditional world views. People, information and things, for example, now circulate and are exchanged throughout the world on a scale that was inconceivable just 10 years ago. As a result, awareness of the Earth as one entity and of people's inter interdependence has increased dramatically, and older nationalistic ways of thinking are being seriously challenged. It is a time when one can hardly say anything significant without adopting a flexible way of thinking and a global outlook. It is also a time when it is vital to establish an identity and character that can withstand the onslaught of billowing waves of changes. Unless one possesses a firm philosophy of life and a tenacious character, he is bound at some point to be caught off balance by the ceaseless waves of change in society and be carried away in their wake. This is uh, where Sensei really begins to look into the future. And of course, we already see waves of change coming at an ever-increasing pace. Over the last 40 or 50 years, this has been evident. But it's not going to calm down 
Sensei is pointing out this is going to increase the pace of change, the pace of life. So we've talked an awful lot, based on Sensei's guidance, about the importance of opening and expanding our lives. This is what this is all about. People with narrow, rigid outlooks won't be able to take it. They'll fall by the wayside and live their lives in a state of apathy, feeling, I can't cope, getting on with whatever they can get on with, making a sort of living, but dreadfully out of rhythm with everything else, and therefore unhappy. This is really uh, what is going to happen, and what is happening already. Maybe you can think of people you know who've given up really coping with the pace of life and sit uh, in the narrow confines of their homes, uh, almost fearful of looking over the fence at what's going on around them. So here again, our good fortune is unbelievable, isn't it? We've got all the tools, everything necessary, face this change of these rapid series of changes no matter what the pace of the world we have the wisdom to cope with it and withstand it and still live valuable vibrant creative lives the Buddha nature in other words within us uh, hasn't got any limits it's broad and it's tall and it's deep. It's boundless. There is nothing that we can't embrace and understand and keep pace with through uh, the Buddha state which we activate through practice with Nechundashan in Tall. I remember uh, quite a long time ago now, uh, and I jotted it down here, <coughs> Sensei said, it must have been 15 years ago at least. It's time that rather than looking at the universe from the point of view of the earth, we stood back and looked at the earth from the point of view of the universe. Mm. And that is what this practice enables us to do. To embrace everything that's happening on this earth in our minds. To take it and understand it and not be frightened of it, but be able to view it as a whole and forge a way of head despite all the difficulties and problems that the world may present. There's nothing to fear, in other words, through this practice. So how can it fail to be that an increasing number of people will be seeking it, though they may not know exactly what it is they're seeking, there are bound to be people, as the acceleration of life and its complexity increases, who are searching for something or other to base, some sort of rock to base their lives on so that they can cope with it. So inevitably, therefore, there will be an acceleration in the number of people who are searching for Namyo Rengeko deep down in their lives, though consciously they won't know. So, therefore, of course, our uh, lives individually, because people will see this actual proof in our lives more and more clearly as the situation gets, accelerates and becomes more difficult, inevitably, therefore, uh, Shakabuku will become uh, more frequent, I believe, and people uh, will grasp whatever they can in order to try and find what they're seeking. So, uh, there are exciting times ahead. And so far as we're concerned, we must work at ourselves through this practice. Now that the 21st century is really looming, the horizon. 
should be a reminder. We mustn't waste time. We must practice wholeheartedly and train ourselves, prepare ourselves for the age which is to come. In other words, to waste what we've got in terms of the weapons to cope with the future, we better learn how to use them fully. The weapons of Gongyo, Daimoku, study and teaching others. So uh, we go on now to the next paragraph and Sensei expands this a little further. Again, these are times when those individuals and groups that cannot keep up with the rapid pace of change soon fall behind the times, disappearing from the scene right and left. The same goes for conventional ways of thinking and forms of expression. In this sense, the 21st century will without doubt be a new age of warring states, a time when all organisations will be pitted against one another in a struggle to survive. This will not be a struggle of military might, nor a struggle of economic prowess alone. Rather, it will be a struggle that will revolve around the questions of how the spiritual domain of people's lives can be opened, how people can be helped to enrich their hearts, and how the dignity of the individual can be realized, as well as of who will be able to realize these things. In this sense, it will be an age of spiritual struggle, a time when the powers of the intellect and wisdom will be brought into full play. It will also be an age of intellectual struggle, when victory or defeat will be decided by the powers of the mind. While it will be an extremely harsh period, it will also present the opportunity for limitless growth and expansion. It will in all likelihood be a thrilling and exhilarating age. How about that? So Sensei, as you know, has long called the 21st century the century of humanity. We're beginning to understand now, through this guidance, why he called it that. And of course, we're already clearly understanding how very small this planet is becoming, isn't it? The unbelievable technological advances that have occurred even in our own lifetimes or perhaps I should say even in your lifetimes, let alone in mine, are absolutely astonishing, aren't they? So uh, when you think of the hundreds and hundreds of years that uh, are in our history before the internal combustion engine was invented, when uh, anything beyond one's own county was a foreign land, and sometimes even beyond one's own village, because of the slowness of communication. And yet today, uh, the whole world is at our feet, isn't it? In a few hours. I remember uh, our annual holiday was to the Isle of Wight when I was a boy. And my father spent about a week preparing his car for the journey. To him it was a major sort of adventure, this journey, when I was a little boy down to the Isle of Wight, including getting onto a ferry and all the rest of it. Unbelievable what went on. The excitement of this journey. All the year round we were looking towards it. And certainly for the last month or so my father was planning what he had to do with his car in order to get there. (laughs) How amazingly it's changed. But another aspect is, of course, that we couldn't do Coast and Rufu like we're doing it without the motorway. The motorways have transformed, although we may hate them in some ways, but they've transformed communication. We can get so quickly anywhere in the UK. So it's nothing uh, for people you know, to get on a, in their car and motor from London to Leeds or something to do a study lecture or whatever it may be, or to give guidance and so on. Astonishing change. Likewise, of course, uh, aircraft uh, have enabled us to link very easily with our friends in Europe to come here. Actually, the very first journey made to this place was made by train and sea and train. Everyone arrived here absolutely exhausted. 
And on the way back, there was a very rough sea, and everyone was sick. And instead of riding that beaming with brightness, they appeared with green faces. It was heavy. And nowadays, you can get on the airplane and do it so quickly. How many people did that train journey? Yeah. So, oh, God, I'll never forget it. <laughs> And then, of course, in the world as a whole, we couldn't go on Toza if it was going to take us a month by ship. But it's not long ago, Barbara Cahill, I'm sure she's told you, it's one of her great memories, her golden memories, was going on Toza by the Trans-Siberian Railway. Can you believe it? Incredible. That was the best and cheapest way to get there. And the quickest quicker than going by sea and much less expensive than going by flying boat or whatever means of aircraft were available and were unbelievably expensive they couldn't afford that in those days so now we have facsimile machines computers satellites communication and so on the general meeting in Japan was uh, televised through satellite to about 25 different great kaikans in Japan so that all the members in all those cities could join in with it. So the time is right for Kosamrufu in every sense. And the wonderful thing I think is that Shakyamuni predicted all this 3,000 years or so ago. It's amazing. And what he said was, wasn't it, you all know the phrase, I'm sure, in the fifth 500 years, which meant after his death, establish Kosen Rufu and never allow its flow to cease. All those years before. Nitrin Dashan in the Gosha constantly repeats that phrase, doesn't he? Gosha after Gosha. And of course, he was born in that fifth 500 years. That is, if you accept the Buddhist view, and not only Nishindashan, it's Buddhism, but Buddhist, the Buddhist view of the date or time at which Shakyamuni Buddha died, which was uh, roughly around about 930, I think it is, BC. So scholars have been arguing for 150 years, ever since Victorian times, and largely in the West, about the date of the Buddha's death. I read a book the other day by an Australian professor. It was very interesting about uh, the growth of understanding of Buddhism in the West. And he was absolutely clear and produced all the necessary uh, examples to prove that this uh, argument among scholars about the date of the Buddha's life all arose because really they wanted... (coughs) to try to bring the Buddha's life nearer to the life of Christ. They didn't particularly want it to appear that Buddhism was that much older. And so they invented, in a way, all these specious arguments why you know, the Buddha must have lived. However, there was always, fortunately, a good cross-section of scholars who didn't agree with that. The argument still goes on. I don't suppose it'll ever be solved. Sensei says at the end there, in this sense it will be an age of spiritual struggle, a time when the powers of the intellect and wisdom will be brought into full play. It will also be an age of intellectual struggle, when victory or defeat will be decided by the powers of the mind. The struggle, he says, of human beings and human organizations to discover a philosophy of life that can keep pace with the speed of scientific and technological development. In other words, uh, the struggle to maintain order and to not allow things to develop any more in a chaotic way, which is bringing the world towards the very brink of disaster. We see today progress at an astonishing speed And it is totally chaotic in terms of life, isn't it? Out of hand, causing the destruction and pollution of the environment uh, and so on. 